Okay, um, so I was thinking, I remember giving a talk to um, a group of uh, paleontologists or geologists or people with those interests, and um, I was thinking there's a lot of obvious differences. Anthropologists, we just study, we study humans and all their breadth, and uh, geologists and paleontologists, I think, of studying sort of the prehistoric life and the environment. Um, so what I, but we both study the material record. And that's one of the things that is in common in terms of archaeology and paleontology. And so what I thought I would do is frame this around a couple of topics that will highlight sort of the breadth of things that you can understand and gain insight into the past by studying the material record. And those topics are embodiment and violence and memory. These are things that I presume that would not be, maybe violence, but not embodiment and memory that you would really talk about in terms of paleontology. And so that was sort of the orientation of what I thought we would do today to talk about some of this. Um, and so I was going to talk about that specifically um, in light of a, a mass grave that I excavated and analyzed some uh, a few years ago. Um, but before I do that, I thought I would talk about... Um, embodiment and what that is to, be, uh, to begin with. Um, there's a lot of different ways of understanding what bodies are. I mean, you can think of body and bodies in terms of bodies as lived experiences. Like when you hear the word embodiment, normally people think like, like the phrase, like he's the embodiment of integrity. That's like this manifestation of an abstract ideal or something like that. It, it kind of is like that. You can think of it as sort of your current body that you have right now as this culmination of all of your life's experiences. That's really what it is. So your growth and development, if you've had illnesses, um, you know, all of my students have tattoos, I think, and so that's something that's all manifest. It's a culmination of those uh, lived experiences. Um, and that's one way to think about um, bodies. Uh, you can also think of them as social canvases, and you can see that... Um, here, obviously, with tattoos, I just mentioned that it signifies things like group membership, right, Marine Corps, or if you're a part of a fraternity, right? So these are all ways that we mark our bodies. And so uh, bodies can function as a social canvas. One other thing that's really interesting about bodies, though, is they can really be uh, considered as political artifacts. And um, to give you two examples of that, um, both in life and in death, uh, this is Geronimo, and the, sometimes you hear in the uh, news that his bones were taken uh, by uh, George Prescott Bush and taken to the Skull and Bones uh, fraternity at Yale. And then there was a big to-do and a political issue because his descendants didn't want a bunch of college frat guys with their ancestors' bones locked up in a, in a chest. And there was a big political debate about who gets to decide what happens to human remains. And this has been manifest in other ways. Another example is, if you, uh, more recently, it was a big deal, was when Osama bin Laden was killed. One of the things that you remember hearing, um, they, they buried him at sea. And one of the points of doing that was, was to sort of deny um, Al-Qaeda a way of making a symbol out of his body, making him into a more of a martyr than he already is. Um, and they didn't even want pictures to get out of that. And specifically, President Obama said, we don't need to spike the football, right? That was one of the things he specifically said in terms of this. So you can see how bodies are political in this regard. And so all of these things sort of lived experience and the way that we use our body to project information about ourselves and the way that bodies can be political, all of that put together and the way that that sort of is always unfolding. And that unfolding, you can think of it as embodiment. Okay, I'm not going to do too much more on that. The point is, the Maya had all of the same things going on. I thought we'd talk about Maya bodies first. Here you see cranial modification. That's something they're well known for, is uh, modification. Um, and this is something that interests me a great deal. Now, why were they doing this? Um, uh, some people think that during the Classic period, which was around AD 300 to 900, different kingdoms would shape their uh, citizens and their societies, they would shape their heads differently, okay? And it made them look like different gods, um, and that was so, it's sort of distinguishing between us versus them. That, that's an ethnic distinction, basically, when you start making those distinctions. Um, you can see this process here. This is no mean... Feet. This isn't just wandering into a tattoo parlor, right? This is something that's done <laughs> repeatedly. You can see these children, kids, you can't even keep their socks on, right? much less try to strap their heads down. And so, you know, they're taking it off, the mothers are having to put it back on constantly. So this is a, a way of projecting sort of social information. Um, and so they were doing a lot of the same things. There was also 
After death, bodies were used in a variety of ways. See, uh, here you can see um, a, no, a long bones that were carved, and they did this with uh, human bones as well. And lots of times these bones of ancestors were used in part to signify a legitimate claim to authority and power. So one king who was coming into power would say, I am a descendant of the last king who just died. And the bones were actually used as a way to delineate that and sort of help uh, identify that. They were also used here, what you see in terms of um, sacrifice. Uh, lots of times um, enemies would be sacrificed and buried as a part of um, newly constructed temples and things like that. Now this did a couple things. One, it got rid of your enemies, but it also was something that um, used their bodies as political and religious symbols. And in Mesoamerica, politics and religion were always intertwined. This, by the way, you can see that this individual was wearing a necklace from his enemy's jaws. And that was something that you saw sometimes. And so this is a nested actual event where you see sort of the victims of the victims there uh, as a necklace. So we'll come back to that. The point is that the Maya, they, in that regard, they viewed bodies in a similar fashion. They were lived experience in terms of their social canvas and also in terms of politics. But they really were different the way they perceived bodies otherwise. The Maya bodies, they didn't perceive them in the same way. They functioned in a very different way. And the easiest way I can talk about that to begin with is the um, idea of souls and how souls were perceived among Mesoamerican cultures. And um, they didn't really have a soul in the way that we might think of a soul, but and this is the best way to start. If you were to go to downtown Kingsport and you were to ask somebody in a conversation, describe to me what a soul is. And this is a strange conversation, but eventually you would get to the point where you'd say, how many souls does somebody have? Well, you know, we think of a person maybe having one. You know, where is it located in your body? You don't have them all over your body. They're not located in certain if you If you lose part of your body, like, you know, an accident, you have amputation or whatever, you don't lose part of your soul. You're not less of a member of society by virtue of that. Their bodies were very different. And so they had a lot of different animating essences. So think of that as having a lot of different souls. And they were variously placed over their bodies. So the first one that you see of their ba was kind of a conflation of personhood and, um, and the head, and it was located in the head. And one of the reasons that you see uh, decapitation so much in sacrificial rites among the Maya, it was appropriating their enemies' essences, right? It was a way of sort of violating their bodies. Um, that also was interesting because that could be extended, I'll come back to this, to things like pictures of people. So you would have a stela which had a carving of a king long after he died, that stela could then be consulted whether should we should go to war or not by the current king, and it would contain some of that bar, right? So it, was, it could be extended past the sort of boundaries of our physical bodies. Eek. Eek was a breath soul and a wind soul, and it was associated with, um, obviously, with your, specifically with your mouth. And the mouth was a locus of a particular sort of power in Mesoamerican cultures, particularly among the Maya. We know that... Um, uh, the word ahau means lord, but it also means speaker, right? Among the Aztec, Platuani uh, refers to real man or someone who is a king, but it also means he who shouts. And so this idea of speaking and was something that was very important in Mesoamerican cultures. So important that ik, this is the day glyph sign for the word ik. And so in the same way we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they had a couple different calendars. One of those was a sacred calendar, and that's the sign for it. And it was important enough that if you see this, that if you carve your incisors, it looks like an eek glyph. You see what I'm saying? So they were translating a lot of these concepts, and in the same way that we get tattoos and things like that, they did tattoos also, but they would sort of have these larger modifications sort of reflecting some of these specific animating essences. Uh, Chulel, that was an eternal and indestructible soul that in the classic period was frequently associated with blood and with the hands. One interesting thing about Ik and Chulel is that not everybody in society had the same amounts, and it may have been different after that, uh, after death, in terms of where somebody went when they died. They did, not everybody got to go to heaven. You didn't get to go to heaven because you were a nice person. If you were a member or part of the elite, you would go to a flowery mountain afterlife or paradise, 
Everybody else was a little bleaker. It really wasn't that friendly of a landing place for a lot of folks. The Wai'i are very interesting. They're completely different. They're these highly impersonal spirits that are associated with animal companions. And when you would go to sleep, they can leave your body. And in fact, lots of times illnesses when you were sick, it was sort of perceived as the, your Wai'i, your animal companions, doing battle with lords of the underworld at night after you were asleep. And it wasn't located in any one specific part of your body. I mean, it's a very exotic and interesting sort of way of thinking about bodies. Um, and what that means then is bodies are highly permeable and they're highly partable. You can divide them up into these constituent parts. Now that's interesting because we think of our bodies as highly individualized, right? If you lose part of it, like I said, you don't, you're not less of a person. You know, how much of your body do you have to lose before you lose your own identity? Right? We think of ourselves lots of times as thinking statues almost. And that was very different for the Maya. I had mentioned um, sacrificial victims in passing on the last slide. I wanted to come back to that. Sacrifice <clears throat> took advantage of a lot of these characteristics about bodies. Okay, that we're pretty clear about that. But the other aspect of sacrifice that was very interesting was driven in part by the Maya religious worldview, uh, an aspect of that which was cyclical time. For us, time goes from past to present to future. It's much more linear. But for the Maya, everything was in these cycles of life and death and rebirth. Everything that was born was going to die, but everything that died was going to be reborn in some capacity. So if you go back to here, one of the reasons you see a lot of sacrifice and people being placed in newly constructed buildings is because those buildings, it wasn't just the people that were alive, it was a lot of non-humans, things like buildings and ceramic vessels and mountains and caves. They were all alive. And when you built a temple, one of the things you had to do was bring it to life. And so you could do that by virtue of this nature of cyclical time by killing something. The sacrifice would bring it to an end, and that later rebirth would bring that temple to life. You see what I'm saying? And that's why you get a lot of this sort of sacrifice taking advantage of these things and um, in the context of cyclical time. This is still done, by the way. They don't use people to do that. But if you go to Tenajapa now in Mexico, um, they'll tell Maya speakers one of the things they do, the last thing they do before they put the roof on a building is they'll kill a chicken. It's placed under the center beam of where the roof is going to be. And it animates or brings that, um, it brings that house to life. So Maya bodies were different. They were really very different than how we think about these. Okay. So for the last almost 15 years now, I've been working on and off in Guatemala. This is right below the Yucatan Peninsula, and here's that inset of where you're looking at. And there's a, a chain of lakes running from east to west <coughs> called the Patin Lakes. Okay, And this is an interesting area to work in that time period called the Post Classic. The Post Classic was from around AD 900 right up until contact with the Spanish in 1524. Okay. And it was interesting because even though there was contact with the Spanish very early, this um, right here basically um, was the last Maya capital. It wasn't conquered until 1697. It was the last Maya capital to fall. So we have 150 years of occasional priests wandering through or soldiers coming through and them making notes. Okay, and so we have a lot of information about that. We know that during this time period there were two ethnic groups that dominated the political geography of the time. The Itza and the Kowo. Okay, the Itza you, you may have heard of um, because of the site Chichen Itza, which is up in the northern uh, of Yucatan. And both of those groups uh, claimed their heritage from this side of Mayapan and uh, for the Itza back to Chichen Itza. And if we know that both groups migrated from those northern sites down into the Batan Lakes region in northern Guatemala. So what I've been studying is a series of deposits that were um, uh, reflect ritual violence. And those are skull pairs, which you can see here, skull rows, and a series of mass graves, which you see here. This is the one I'm going to spend uh, the rest of our time talking about today. Um, and basically, We know that these skull rows, uh, excuse me, the mass graves were found at two sites, uh, the site of Zakpatin and the site of Toposhtay. 
both fall within the Kuo territory. Okay, and in fact, fairly early on, we knew that these were made by the Kuo. And the one I'm going to talk about is the one I excavated and analyzed from this site of Zaka Paten. Okay, so this is Zaka Paten. Um, this was the Kuo's capital at the time of contact with the Spanish. And um, this is the group A is the primary ceremonial group um, right here. Okay. We know that because this is the primary temple, and it had some other important buildings around it called the Colonnaded Hall, an oratorio, and these little shrines right there. Okay. One other interesting thing about this was this really pretty big depression, like, um, I don't know, like eight meters by seven meters or something like that, once you got down in it. And the person who had been excavating the architecture in 1997 put a test trench in there. And that was what you saw right here. That was where his test trench went. And he found a huge jumble of remains that looked like this and said, I'm going to leave this and let somebody else excavate. <laughs> right? that's, uh, that's how I got interested and involved in this. Okay. So what I thought we would do then, let me actually say this. We know that this is the Kuo who were living here, in part because of the nature of this architecture. When you see a combination of a temple, an oratorio, a colonnaded hall, and this framework with these shrines, that's called a Mayapan-style temple assemblage. And it's found at the site of Mayapan that I showed you um, up in the Yucatan. And that's where the Kuo migrated from. There's other things like ceramics. But there's a lot of mass graves up at that site also. So we knew that it was the Kuo. So what I'm going to do today is I will walk you through the osteology of actual human remains and the study of that. And then we'll talk about the archaeology, and this will come full circle to embodiment, violence, and memory uh, by the last slide. Okay. So this is the first thing you do when you have a big jumble of these remains um, for the osteological analysis is you count how many of each bone you have in the inventory. And the way and we normally do this, this is slightly different than people studying um, uh, our uh, animals in archaeological context is we use what's called an MNI, which is the minimum number of individuals. You go through and you would count, let's say, look at a humerus. You would say, how many humeri do we have, these upper arm bones? And you can separate them out by left and right. You can separate them out by age and by, in some cases, some bones by sex. And you get the minimum number of individuals that you have because you know that if you have at least two left humeri, there have to be two people there, and that's sort of what this, this is reflecting. Well, so for the overall size of this, the minimum number of individuals was 37. Okay, we know that there were at least 37 because of the femora and also because of the temporal bones. The temporal bones are right here, and where your ear hole is. And we, that's interesting, one, because it's in the head, but it's also a real hard piece of bone on the inside, and it preserves really well. And in the Maya area, nothing preserves well because it's really hot and wet, and it's all limestone, so it just all gets eaten away. So that, was one, that gives us some sense of the size of the grave we were talking about. The other thing that was very interesting about this is if you look at some of these smaller elements, so if you're looking at your hand bones, if you're looking at your finger bones, or if you're looking at your toe bones, there's a much smaller minimum number of individuals. Does anybody want to take a guess of why you see a smaller number of individuals? Cut off. Okay, they could either be cut off, that's certainly true, and we'll come back to that. But for these small things like that, when you consistently see it across an assemblage, they were moved. It's a secondary burial. That's one of the things. If you bury a complete individual or soon after death, in a primary context, you don't see this consistent discrepancy okay, between the, um, uh, between the large elements that preserve well and these small ones. Because when you're picking up bones, there's 206 bones, you don't get all of them, and the small ones are the ones you miss. So that was interesting. In addition to that, there was a lot of processing of these remains. Okay? Uh, I think you can see certainly right here, okay, this is the back of an, uh, of an ola. Uh, this is at the elbow at your radius. That's the thumb side uh, bone of your um, forearm. This is the outside edge, the lateral side of a clavicle, and you can see cut marks there. Um, there were cut marks on a lot of these bones. Um, 
It wasn't just cut marks, though. They were processed in different ways. There was two femora, and this is sort of the, if this is your femur, you're looking here, this sort of about the middle, the, the, the bottom half of the top third of it. Um, it had been split longitudinally, and it had been grinded down. Okay, you see these elsewhere in Mesoamerica, but one of the, and we don't know exactly what they're for. Some of these things that uh, human remains are used for are like musical instruments, but for some of these, we're not sure exactly. This wasn't a rasp or anything like that. People speculate, was it a water spout? Was it used to grind things up? And we're not certain exactly. The other interesting thing you saw about this, some of these teeth, like this uh, maxillary molar, had holes drilled in the roots, okay? This is an animal canine that had the similar treatment, okay? That was interesting because that implies that they were taking some of them. They were processing these and presumably hanging them from some things when you start to see that. So they were thoroughly processed. One interesting thing that I went through and counted these, um, so let me tell you what you're looking at is the pattern that emerged. Here are your adults and here are your juveniles. The proximal, like if you're taking your arm bone, that means up here close to your body, the middle, and then the distal is the one down at your elbow, okay? And so if you go through and look at all of these long bones and you try to quantify these, the interesting thing is right here, there are cut marks in the middle of a lot of these long bones. And you see that for the adults and to a lesser degree with the juveniles. There weren't that many cut marks on the juveniles. Now the reason that is interesting to me is because if you just dismember somebody, what you typically see is cut marks just on the ends of the long bones. And that is what you see here. This is at another site uh, that I excavated um, before I did the mass grave. And you can see this. This is clearly a case of sacrificial victims who were dismembered. So what you're looking at right here are cervical vertebra, the vertebra in your necks. There's no head there. <laughs> here, uh, this is where your thigh bone, your femur, articulates with your pelvis. Okay? It's not there. What they've done is they removed the heads, hands, and feet, and they process these long bones and put them as a big bundle on top of the chest. And there were several of these guys. You can see them here. This, this is from above. You can see that. They were all sort of lined up in a row. But the point is, in cases of dismemberment, you only see cut marks. This is looking at the back of a femur. You can see those little uh, lines. You only see them at the joints and at the ends of long bones. So what that means is, for these cut marks here, the fact that there were a lot of cut marks in the middle means that they were actually processing this. It, it was different than just uh, mere dismemberment. It was either some kind of flaying that was going on or it was some kind of just general destruction. Okay. You asked about taking uh, remains. That became evident they were targeting the um, maxillary molars. And so remember I talked about the minimum number of individuals? Well, we saw those holes drilled in the roots, and you can see that for all of these other tooth fields, your canines, your incisors, and premolars on both sides, uh, they're present in a higher number than what you see for the molars, okay? So they were targeting that. Now, that's consistent with what we know about one of the seats of power sort of within a Mesoamerican body, targeting things like eek or breath salt, okay? <laughs> And you can see that here. And I showed you this earlier. But this is an example of a maxilla that has been cut. And this is from a tomb I analyzed in Oaxaca, Mexico. But you can see in black here, this is part of a maxilla that has been cut off. And basically, this is the front of the mouth. This would be your sinus. And this would be the inside of your nose. And all of this right here that's flat, that's been sawed off to make uh, into uh, an artifact that could be worn. And you see this example, which was taken from this individual, and it's the same processing that's going on for the people who are wearing them as necklaces. And so that was the same thing that we were seeing, uh, at least targeting the mouth for some kind of violence going on uh, in the mass grave in Zakta 10. Okay. Now, the really interesting thing, it's all interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I love this. But the really interesting thing was when you compared left and right uh, of the arm bones. Okay, so if you look at the left humerus, you get a total MNI of 20, she, and the right only had 13. For the radius, 22 versus 14, and the ulna, 28 versus 14. They were targeting the uh, left versus right specifically for inclusion in this grave. 
This has never actually been shown before in actual human remains. It's only been demonstrated iconographically, but here's why. All right. Um, well, let me show you, first of all, the, before I get to the picture. The thing that I wondered was, well, did they really know? Were they doing this intentionally? Because if they just wanted to have only left bones in there, why were there any right bones at all? It could have just been done from some, this could be a tertiary gray where they got them all out of another secondary context. So what we did was a spatial analysis of the remains. So let me um, walk you through this. This is the, um, the grave. And you can see here are the grid lines with the northings and the eastings down here. Okay, so you're going to see a couple of pictures of the next three slides that you'll see this grid, basically. Okay, so here's what we found. Look at the right and the left tibia. Okay, so uh, just focus on the top part right now. The left are the squares and the right are the triangles. We went through and we plotted where we found each of those, okay? Then we went through and did a spatial analysis. So take, for example, the red circle. That red circle is roughly one meter in radius, okay? <clears throat> what this analysis does is it looks and it calculates how many, how many other individuals should you expect to find in that given circle, okay? Now, if you find it, and it tells you if it falls within the two solid lines, then that's a pattern that is consistent with random chance, okay? If your dotted line down here falls below the two solid lines, that means that you are finding more neighbors in that circle than you would expect to from random chance. If it falls above that, then you're finding fewer neighbors than you would expect to find by random chance. And that's what you would get if everything were placed like just on a grid, right, where everything was evenly spaced. Now, the neat thing about this spatial analysis is it's not just at one meter, it does it continuously. So this would be a red circle of 0.1 meters, right? How many neighbors would you expect to find in that? This would be for one meter. And this would be for one and a half meters. And it can, so think of that red circle as starting at the black square and getting big, okay? And you're looking at how many neighbors you would expect to find in each one. So what we found, you can actually see this here, is it looks like they're, to some degree, they're kind of paired. That one's paired. You can see some there, 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 there. Those are paired. That looks like it's paired. It wasn't evident when we were excavating what was going on, but that was what, um, uh, it was statistically significant, the fact that it fell outside of those lines. Now that pattern, it's worth noting, left, left and right shin bones, that's the tibiae, they, aren't, they don't occur in the body next to one another. That means they were placed there together by getting those from another burial. So look at this. You see the same pattern if you look at the humerus, okay? It's the same thing. There is this increased sort of pairing that you see. You're seeing things clustered together. That's what it means. All right, let's look at this one. Now, let's look at something in the body that actually does co-occur in an articulated skeleton. Your forearm bones, your left, ulna, and radius. You can really clearly see the pairing here, right? You see how that looks like those are co-occurring? That, that, you can see those all over. And that's why that clustering is why you see that down there. There's not that much more math. I, think you, I, I don't want to bore you guys with this, but this is, we're almost there. This gets really interesting. When you compare the right ulna and radius, you don't see that. The right were the ones that were missing, and they have a completely different spatial pattern than all the others. And that means that it was done intentionally. That was, this is important because when you're talking about all this body stuff, it gets to be just a story very fast. How do you actually engage this stuff in an empirical fashion when you're trying to test any of it? And spatial analysis lets you do that. This is clearly a different pattern than what you saw for the others. So now the question is why was that different? What was going on? And here's the answer. This is a mural from uh, the Maya era from a site called Bonham Park. What you can see here is uh, captives who've been tortured um, there at the bottom. And you see, I tried this on my six-year-old. I said, who's the most important guy? Not that. I tried this. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to this. I said, who's the most important guy in this painting? He says, oh, the guy with the spear. That's definitely the most important guy. And I said, yeah, that's right. That's correct. What you'll see in Maya murals is superordinate people, the people who have the highest status, who are most important, they're all right-handed. 
vanquished enemies, sacrificial victims, they're portrayed as left-handed. What they were doing by omitting the right was sort of associating these people in this pit with the left-hand side of the body. And that was what was so interesting about this, because I've seen it's happened, it's been demonstrated in iconography, but it's never been demonstrated in actual human remains in a grave before. So there was a lot of different ways that you were actually sort of seeing bodies violated, symbolically and physically. So clearly what was going on, there was this dismemberment and a defleshing that was happening. They were targeting the mouth. It was also associated with the left side, these remains were. So this constitutes violence. And it's an obvious thing to say, but violence sometimes is hard to identify. We do a lot of things for our bodies that to an outsider looks pretty violent, right? And so this is something that we can feel pretty reasonable about. So what led to this? What actual scenarios, you know, were they sacrificed enemies? They could be, but they weren't just buried immediately after sacrifice. That much is clear. They were processed thoroughly and probably were buried previously. Um, one, another one is, were they war dead? We know that the Itzan, quote, consistently had this sort of internecine warfare going on, skirmishing on a low level. They didn't have uh, standing armies, but they did have a lot of raiding groups going back and forth. That's certainly possible. But again, they were not buried immediately after dying. In addition to that, it wasn't like a raiding party because they were infants, right? They were uh, in this uh, mass grave. Um, and so there was of all ages of represented. One other idea is, that the Kuo, when they took over the site, they actually dug up their enemies' bodies, and they violated them, they defiled them, and then reburied them, okay? And it could be some combination of these three, but the second one that you see there, the desecration of enemy bodies, is most consistent with the fact that it's a secondary burial. Okay, so that's the osteology. Let's talk about the archaeology. While we were excavating this, several things became clear. First of all, there were, where these red circles are, those were features that were on the edge of the outside of this pit. Features are non-portable evidence of human activity. That's what a feature is, basically. An artifact is a portable feature, uh, aspect of uh, human activity. And the interesting thing about this was, so these were things like an intentionally buried plate, as you could see. This is some of the jumble of animal and human bones that had been burned in situ, which is they were burned right there on the spot. These things dated to over a thousand years in terms of their use of, uh, uh, of activity patterns. This pit had been used for over a thousand years, okay? The interesting thing about this was, so that implies for this ritual activity that it was a previously sacred area. Whoever decided to put this mass grave in there was doing it in a place that would be the equivalent of putting a mass grave you know, in a church or something like that. It's, it's, a, it's sort of violating an important um, uh, area. All right, so let me show you, I want to show you the profile now and give you some sense of the actual excavation of this. So again, this is where group A is um, and the mass grave or Operation 1000. If you were standing where my pointer is and looking this way, you will see a profile of that red line. That's what I'm about to show you on the next one. And this is... So if you're standing where that red arrow is, these rocks right here, that's right there, okay? These, this right here, this slope, that would be this building right there. So that's sort of give you some sense if you were cutting down looking at that profile. All right, so what do we have? Layer six is the mass grave, okay? Layer eight was these fist-sized chunks of white limestone. Okay, they had been placed in the ground. Below that was bedrock, so that was the thing that was placed in the ground uh, first. Above that, there was a burning layer where they had burned, and that was clearly, burning was associated with uh, purification, it was a ritual act. Then the mass grave was put down, and then it was covered with these larger cut limestones. They were also white in color. And on the edge over here, layer five, they had chipped off the edge of the pit to cover the remains on the periphery. Everything above that, 4, 2, 2, B, 2, D, all of that was collapse that fell in on top of it. So what you see, in addition to choosing an area that was a really important sacred space, this was the last thing that was done in this pit until we excavated it. Because this layer that was intentionally placed is only covered by a few inches of grass and uh, humus. Does that make sense? So 
That means they took a previously sacred ritual spot that had been used for over a thousand years, and they put defiled enemy bodies there, okay, and then they left it. The interesting thing is they were still walking around using this area, all right? And if you put something in the ground and you know it's there, and you're walking around it and living around it but not touching it, that implies some kind of taboo. <laughs> memory is a tricky thing to get at, right? It's ephemeral. How do you assess memory? But this is some evidence that it played some part in people's consciousness that they were walking around this thing, living here, and they were uh, avoiding it, okay? And that was also true because of the fact that those remains were sealed in white. We talked about cyclical time, right? That was something I mentioned. That everything is caught up in these cycles of birth, death, and rebirth. And the fact, when you killed somebody in a sacrifice, what that effectively did is punctuate those cycles of birth and death. It sort of, it, it, you know, everybody talked about in 2012, the Maya talked about, you know, the world's coming to an end, right? That was a thing you heard. That was the end of a time period of 144,000 days. And that was the end of the 13th Bakhtun, okay? The point is, Humans have to act in Mesoamerica to bring those cycles to an end. You have to help frame time, okay? Sacrifice is one thing that does that. But one of the things that happens in a part of that cyclical time is things also get ritually wrapped up and bundled, okay? And that sort of, um, it sort of helps pause those cycles. So let me give you an example. Wrapping is an important ritual phenomenon in Mesoamerica. This is an Aztec god, Huitzilopochtli. Um, the Aztecs, when they were doing their migrations in the desert before they founded their capital, Tenochtitlan, their, their legends say that they were all wandering in the desert and they were carrying their mummy bundle of Huitzilopochtli, one of their gods. When they saw an eagle carrying a snake in, who landed on a cactus, they said, we were going to put Tenochtitlan here. And you've all seen that because you've seen the Mexican flag, and that's the symbol on the Mexican flag, okay? Well, the point is, but the first thing they did is they build, one of the first important things they do is they build this temple, the Temple of Mayor. They have a ritual fire, okay? And then the first thing they do is they put the uh, mummy bundle, their god, inside of that, okay? Mummy bundles, um, and bundles in general, wrapping was an important ritual phenomenon, okay? It sort of wrapped up ancestors, but I'm arguing that by virtue of sealing everything in white, they were also doing that to these enemy remains. That's what they were doing at the mass grave. You can see this wrapping here. They even wrapped up um, units of time. This is the stela that you can see. And on the stela, they were in part sort of commemorating a lot of politics, but they were also uh, commemorating the end of a 20-year cycle called cartoon, or just about 20 years. And at the end of a cartoon, they would wrap those things up. It was punctuating those cycles, okay? And what I would say is, I think most people seem to agree with this, is that by wrapping this, because white was explicitly associated with these bundles, wrapping up this and the, these two layers of three and eight, they were wrapping up these remains. And that was the equivalent of kind of boxing up this malevolent potency that was associated with enemy remains. If they had wanted to, they could have just chucked these in the, in the lake. This is on a peninsula, right? They could have gotten rid of these anytime they wanted to. They didn't do that. They chose to hold on to these, and they boxed them up. And the interesting thing about that is they're not that far from their enemies. Their enemies knew they were there, and the Kowo knew they were there. And it would be the equivalent of taking George Washington's bones, right? If Canada kind of started to get uppity, and they were going to take George Washington's bones, and they were going to make a symbol out of that and violate those, it would drive us up the wall. And that's really the equivalent of what's going on. And this is what is happening here. And the dates were really important to this because we dated both the bones as well as the wood um, uh, from layer six. They were all dating to around the time we know that the Gawo came over and took over that site. What this was was a massive founding event. When the Gawo took over the site, they dug up their enemy's remains and they violated them and they made a public symbol out of those. And it was something they knew and they were aware of, and the enemies were aware of it also. And that was the, where you see uh, this at this site of Zakpaten. We know that they migrated from Mayapan up here. They migrated down into the Paten Lakes region. Their first capital was over here at Topoche, but by the time the Spanish had come and were starting to make maps like this, 
their, some of their capital had moved to Zakhmatin in the middle, and they had asserted political control over the northern shores of the lakes. And that is how we know that it was part of this large founding event. It was a violation and display of enemy bodies, and it created an enduring sort of public symbol of this violation to emphasize the weakness of their enemies. And all of that from taking specific aspects of embodiment, like targeting the mouth, the association with the left instead of the right, um, the fact that it was ritually sealed, all of that speaks to the fact that to really understand this, you have to engage sort of indigenous concepts of what bodies are. You have to know how people violate other people. And you have to have some understanding of the idea of public memory. If you didn't have all of those things together, you really wouldn't be able to understand this scenario in terms from an insider's viewpoint, I think. And there may be other aspects that we don't know. In fact, there almost certainly were. But insofar as we're able to speak to these, I think we uh, it's, it's the best story going, I would say, in terms of actually explaining how this mass grave came to be. That's it. Thank you very much.